Hello everyone and welcome to the Geek Nerder podcast. I am your host Kevin Leapte and I am back with another episode on yet another database. I asked this question on Twitter uh, while I was doing this series on databases like what other database databases should I cover? And there was one database which caught quite a lot of interest and that was Tiger Beetle DB. So today we are going to talk about Tiger Beetle DB, about its performance, about its safety features, about developer experience about how it works internally. So to discuss that with me, I'm joined by Yoran, who is the CEO and co-founder of Tiger Beetle DB and pretty well known when it comes to databases. So welcome, Yoran. Thanks a lot for joining me. And so nice of you to reply to me on Twitter and joining me today. And here we are. So thanks a lot. And let's start with a little bit of introduction about yourself, about your background and what you have been up to at Tiger Beetle DB? Oh, th thanks so much, Kevy. It's just nice for me that you reached out on Twitter. I, I was so excited. I was just wait. I was really wanting to come and chat with you, and I saw the amazing episodes you were putting out. So I was so so humbled that you gave us the opportunity. We we're a little database, a little Tiger Beetle still. So so nice to come and chat. And so a bit about me. My interests have always been speed. So how, how do you write algorithms that are fast? Security, I was doing some security consulting in doing static analysis for zero-day exploits. And, and I really love hacking and CVEs and bug bounties and things like that. I, I did that for a while. And then, so speed, security, and also storage. So that's been a big theme of my life as a coder for a while. And I had, th there was this fork in the road at one point, the computer science exploded with all the machine learning research a few years ago, it already started then. And you just see this whole new world is about to be created, be born. And now there's these papers coming out and you think, I've got to start reading ML like in, in 2015. And then I held back from that because my first love was all the storage research coming out of the FAST conference. So. It was a little hobby of mine. I would always follow that fast conference for years. Uh, there was also a blog called High Scalability that I'm sure many, many of us will, will know. And that blog held me by the hand and showed me the way of distributed systems and that fast conference storage papers and research. And so I held back on ML and I thought, let me just focus on storage and distributed systems, speed and security and, and then sort of the flip side of security coming into Tiger Beetle was safety. But those have been, uh, yeah, I'm a self-taught coder since, since I was staring in wonder at a 286. And, and then I actually it wasn't my major. I studied financial accounting because I've always loved business and wanted to, to tour the world of business, see different industries and the language that they speak is financial accounting, whether it's mining, whether it's banking. Retail, logistics, all the whole world speaks financial accounting in, in that is the query language that they speak. So I was interested in that. And then I felt the pull of coding because that's always been my, that, that's the thing that, that gives, I, I can lose five hours like, like that. So that's who I am as a coder, self-taught and yeah. Basically that, that's sort of been my focus. And then Tiger Beetle happened. I think for a lot of people, there was COVID and for me, it was COVID and, and in that time. It was a tough time and then and Tiger Beetle happened. So yeah, pleasure to be here again. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. And it's very cool to hear about your journey in, into databases and how you uh, did this pivot. Interesting. And so let's dive into understanding some of the, let's say the why, why parts and why such, uh, this database exists and what was the historical context. So. First, let's talk about financial transactions database. So these are like terms. I guess everyone understands what it means, but how would you define a financial transaction database? So I think I've changed my mind on this. I used to, uh, so if you followed, you, if, if you go into Internet Archive and you look at Tiger Beetle on the GitHub repo on, on the website, you'll see we, we've sort of tweaked it a little bit. We used to say, I think we said accounting database, then we said financial accounting database, and now we say financial transactions database. And I think other people would call this a ledger database. And I actually think we're none of these things that this is what I've come to realize. 
So I, I used to think that we were doing something new. Why a new database? And actually now I think the question is why an old database? Because I think what we really, and I was just lucky I stumbled into this. So I love Jim Gray and he's given us so many things. I think he coined the term acid. He also gave us the five minute rule. Something I didn't know that he did was he created the very first benchmark for databases, I, I believe. And, and that benchmark was so popular, it led to benchmark wars. And because that was now such a problem, the TPC had to be formed as a council to regulate database benchmarks. And that was Jim Gray. So I never knew that. I mean, I should have, but I, I discovered this recently that actually he's the father of like how we think of OLTP, online transactions processing. And I, for me, I always thought, well, what is OLTP? I would have said for a long time, I would have said OLTP is SQL transactions, database transactions processing, SQL transactions. I think everybody would say that. But I would be wrong, I think, if I did, because I was chatting with Hannes Mulesen of, of DuckDB, and this shows that I'm self-taught, but we were in London in April last year, and obviously DuckDB is an OLAP database, an analytics database, not an OLTP database. And Hannes said to me, so I, I, we just a bit of background, we were at, at QCon in London, we were both speaking in the same track, and my talk was a lot about F-Sync gate and database durability and how things can go wrong and actually how databases don't always get this right. It's so tricky. And I, I was really just trying to shine a spotlight on, again, the storage research from University of Wisconsin-Madison. But what was surprising was that chatting with Hannes is actually they got this durability stuff mostly correct in DuckDB and they were really good at it. And he said, of course, we offer SQL transactions in DuckDB. And that, that blew me away because I would have thought, well, the difference between OLTP and OLAP is SQL transactions. So therefore, clearly, the definition of what is OLTP cannot be SQL transactions. That is not enough to be an OLTP database because even OLAP has that too. OLAP can do SQL transactions, even as an embedded database. So, so again, what is the question? What is a financial transactions database? I think my journey, it, what I've been learning is actually, it's what Jim Gray said. Uh, and this really surprised me is that the very first OLTP benchmark was actually called debit credit. The first databases, and they always have been, they, they're hiding in plain sight, but they're ledger databases. Uh, o, OLTP really is transactions processing and transaction there speaks to the real world. So I think as engineers, we're, we're so used to engineering. We have the technology and then we want to apply it. And we say, well, it's SQL transactions and every, and sure that works, but actually the origin of these things is it's the other way around. So it came to us from all these different industries like mining, energy, retail, logistics. They have business transactions. And this was what Jim Gray was trying to benchmark is how fast can your database process business transactions online as someone sits at a terminal. So, so what is a financial transactions database? Th this is maybe a bit controversial, but I would say, well, really it, it is, if you look at OLTP, that's, that is what it is. And th this has been fascinating for me now to think about it. How do we categorize databases? What is OLAP? What is OLTP? Is there actually something in between that we've been missing all along? That is very interesting. And there's again uh, these uh, HTAP uh, models as well, right? Like that they, they kind of support both uh, transactional and analytical workload. Uh, and those are really great points. And that has made me curious and I've noted down some of the things I have to go back and kind of learn and make my basics better. But the way I think, usually think about like at a high level about OLAP versus OL is that, and this is very high level, like, OLTP talks about transaction, which is about like one thing. Let's say if I have to take an example, like orders is cre order is created or product is added and all those kind of things. Like it's talk about, it talks about one thing. Analytics is uh, talking about like a group of things and sort of some numbers or aggregations on top of it. Like give me a count, give me some, 
within some certain time range and those kind of things. And though this classification has sort of worked out for me in when I when it comes to understanding what kind of workloads are we talking about, because it gives me instant relation to the practical world. So is it is it a good classification? Do you want to add something there? Oh, I'm with you on that. I was chatting with two researchers from TUM in Munich yesterday that worked on Umbra, and we were asking these questions, and I think you nailed it. And the, what's interesting there is because analytics is dealing with more things, it, it always takes time to collect those things in the first place. Yeah. So what that means is you're working with data maybe more at a control plane level after the fact. So the data has already come in. Now you've got a lot of data. Now you want to ask questions out of the data. So the, dire the data direction is coming out of your screen. You, 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 you're using SQL to query the data. Obviously, SQL is also a data format, which we can come to. Is it a good data format? But it, obviously, hands down, it's a fantastic query language. If, you, if your data direction is out, you want SQL. And so analytics is asking questions about a lot of data. But if you tease that out, well, that data has already been collected. Whereas yeah. transactions processing is atomic business transactions. And, and some, sometimes those one, one real illogical business transaction might actually for example, a customer order from the, the, there's the, the user's perspective, they have one transaction with the business, but that business internally might do, and I've spoken to people, this actually surprised me too, but they might do a thousand business transactions physically for that one logical customer transaction. And that is a valid product there. They've designed it correctly so that you've got a, an amplification of one to a thousand and then <clears throat> but then those thousand one piece of work but i think that also means that analytics you're looking at data after the fact there's a lot of data it took time to be gathered transactions processing you've got these atomic business transactions coming in sometimes a thousand just from one real world event but put that aside for the second then for the minute and you've got these individual things coming in but what that really means is the data direction has changed so with analytics or with what I would say is OLGP, general purpose processing databases like Postgres or CockroachDB or MySQL or SQLite, Aurora, Neon. It's all general purpose workloads. So there's generally there's a 50-50 split between read and write. When you look at business transactions, it, all the data is, is coming in. So the data direction has changed and it's really like, let's just get the data in and then we will query it. But the volume is very different and it happens in the data plane. So it's not after the fact, if we look at the two ex extremes. Yeah. But I think there's also more, uh, I think, so the red herring is SQL transactions. That's not the differentiated because OLAP all have SQL transactions. So I think you're getting at it. It's the, when is the data created? When is the query happening? Uh, other things that how what, what I'm learning are it's the workload. The workload is very different. So for example, data direction, it's the reverse direction. You basically, you've got a fire hose and you're trying to drink from it as quickly as possible. Analytics is it's the opposite. You've got a massive lake and you want to pump, pump insight out so that your analytics will ask why and what if. OLTP will say, it's really trying to just put the data in and say, and this is the data of like the who, what, when, where, why, how much. It's people in the real world transacting. Money is moving from one person or place to another, or goods are moving, or someone is counting the usage of their serverless API as a serverless startup. Wherever you're counting things or transacting, it's not necessarily monetary, but these are some of the differences. So workload, we can drill into workload a bit more. The other thing is engine, database engine. So I think if you look at DuckDB, it's a duck. If you look at Tiger Beetle, it's a Tiger Beetle. It's a, the anatomy is totally different. It's so, so different. The engine is different. I, even if you look at general purpose databases like Postgres, they will use B-trees, MySQL, SQLite. 
but bee trees optimize in terms of the rum conjecture. They are optimized more for reeds. So it, 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 it's a different data direction again. LSM trees really are, are, are what you want f for the OLTP uh, data flow. That is 10 times more write efficient. That was the MyRox experiment that they did. They basically took MySQL and they put RoxDB in That's and they cool. found write efficiency went up 10x. In their words, not mine. But I've always seen, so LSM is just for me, it's my world that I live in, not bee trees. But I think that's also got to do with this, how do we classify a database as OLTP or OLAP? We'll look at the engine, and I, but the workload is the most interesting. Yeah. There's something there that a lot of people don't know, it, what makes an OLTP workload so hard. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we'd love to dive into it with you. Um, but th that is a great hmm. perspective. and. Um, it definitely brought a lot more clarity. So I, I see people talking about OLAP versus OLTP and they directly jump onto the implementation details, which are like, oh, OLAP uses a column store and it's based on, let's say, LSM trees. And it's true, but it's already going into the implementation detail, right? Like Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> Since you mentioned some of the, the general purpose uh, databases like MySQL, Postgres, and uh, I've seen these uh, like general purpose problems like uh, e-commerce and finance and insurance domains uh, solving all these use cases using these general purpose databases, right? Like MySQL, Postgres. And I, I love these databases. Uh, so I keep asking myself whenever I talk about a new database, why do we need another database, right? And so I would love for us to go dive deep into this section on different metrics. So we talked about like performance, safety, developer experience, right? So let's start with performance and try to understand mm. like what Tiger Beetle DB is doing differently as compared to general purpose databases like Postgres, MySQL, and SQLite, and why they are not as performant as Tiger Beetle DB. Yeah, sure. So I, I think we, we come to it now. In the beginning, there was OLTP, Jim Gray, and it was transactions processing business events. And then someone said, why do we need a, 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 a new database? And that was Edgar Codd, I think in 93, said, well, we need it because there's now OLAP. So he coined the term OLAP. In 97, there was the, I think the OLAP council, there was a white paper and they, they said, well, we need OLAP because of the why and the what if queries. We've got to, we've realized that we have a different workload. So you had, OLTP workload, Jim Gray, and those TPC benchmarks are all A, B, and C. The context there is banking, financial, brokerage, warehouse, it's orders, it's the language of debit credit, which up until now, SQL was also used as the ingestion data format. We'll come back to that. But th this is where in the beginning there was OLTP, and then Edgar Codd said, well, then there's OLAP. And why do we need OLAP? Well, we've got different workload, different queries, different data direction. So, so someone, there was, someone pulled the elastic out and there was OLAP. And I think today, so why do we need Tiger Beetle? I think what we've realized is that today, what we think is OLTP is actually not. The world has pulled the elastic out. The workloads... The workload has stayed the same, but the scale has increased so massively. For example, in India, real-time payments in India through UPI, last year in one month, they crossed 10 billion transactions. To put that in perspective, that's 10 billion logical transactions. And typically for each logical transaction, there are at least 10, there would have been 10 SQL transactions. So the scale is massive and that will be tripling in, 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 a, in the matter of a year or, or two. And so, so again, the, the, someone has pulled the elastic and that is the world because the world has become more transactional. The volume has just increased. So the workload has stayed the same, but the volume has gone through three orders of magnitude. Uh, for example, in the energy sector, if you were tracking transactions as an energy utility, you used to send people an invoice once a month for their energy usage. You'd go maybe to their house, check their meter reading, send them a bill once a month. And then clean energy came along and the government mandated and said, well, the sun is not monthly. The sun is not even daily. 
the efficiency of solar changes by the minute. So if we really want to be clean as a country, we need to have more flexible transactional systems for energy. We need to settle energy quicker. We need to arbitrage the sun. We can't arbitrage the sun once a month. So we need to set in law now, I think, if I understand correctly, it's every 30 minutes you have to be able to price energy or settle energy or measure what energy is doing. So all of a sudden, again, someone is pulling the elastic and just like OLAP pulled the elastic, and I think we're still feeling the effects. You go to a database conference and it's all analytics. That is really the focus these days, which is amazing because they're doing phenomenal work. But what's happening now is, is going on the other side. And so all of a sudden, for example, again, in energy, your volume has gone up 1,440x, three orders of magnitude. And so the workload is the same, but the spotlight and the brightness of that has increased. And so it's a car. You're driving it a thousand times faster. Anything that's not aerodynamic burns up. And so I think what we start to see is really what we thought OLTP was is really OLGP, general purpose processing. If, but those systems cannot handle the scale. And the reason is the workload. So here we come to it now. Why Tiger Beetle? Why has OLTP moved out? Why do we need something more specialized? And the answer is workload. And that is because if you look at the energy utility, if you look in India, there will be, for example, a million customers of an energy utility, and that energy utility is now going to set, is going to transact every 30 minutes. That's all fine. We can handle that with our horizontal solutions. No problem. The thing, I think the secret of OLTP that even, it, this is not well known. People taught this to me from the payments world that had worked at Ripple, at ACI, Postillion Switch, Stanchion, they sort of took me aside and said, Yaron, this is the thing you really need to understand. And I, I would never have gotten this otherwise. The secret is that you have a million customers, it's high cardinality. There's always a, a, a counter party. If you do a transaction, it takes two, two to contract, not, not one. The counterparty is the business, so it's the business bank account, and there's typically one bank account. So all those million transactions, it, it looks like you can shard them horizontally, but actually you can't. The moment you try to do that, you actually get worse performance because now all your servers are chatty over the network. They're exposed to more network weather, but they're still going to serialize through that shard that has the bank account. And you see this, whether you zoom out and your microservice is distributed. If you zoom into Postgres, it's the same problem because Postgres will take a row lock every time you update the bank account row. And so basically why Tiger Beetle? Well, we were analyzing a real payment switch that needed more volume. And that was the things were burning up. And we saw, well, the real problem here is that Postgres or MySQL are, are locking these hot accounts, which are low cardinality. So you can't shard. It's that the horizontal option is taken off the table. If you try to shard, it gets worse because now you're trading off Moore's law by betting on the speed of light in fiber, which is constant. So if you think Moore's law is dying, 10 years later, you start to go horizontal. You think that's how you scale. 10 years later, you realize, gee, we've got the M3 coming out, 100 billion transistors. And even if Moore's law is not doubling, well, it's, it's still 1.5, but the speed of light and fiber latency and the bandwidth is increasing, yes, but latency in networks is the same. And it's, it's never going to change. Maybe we'll approach 70% of the speed of light and fiber. But it, 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 so as soon as you go horizontal, it's kind of like you saying, we're going to stop racing because these other things are getting faster. And really to handle contention, you need a different database anatomy. You can't have Rolox, you can't go horizontal. You need something totally different. It looks like a, a beetle or a duck, not an elephant. So I, I don't know. I think that is the big reason why Tiger Beetle. We can then go into how we solve it later. Uh, you, you tell me, may, may, maybe we must move on. I'm happy to just keep going on. No, I, I, th I yeah. think it will go into the internals uh, hmm. a bit later because I guess I am totally understanding the context and the problem with contention that you mentioned. I'm just curious. And so, for example, Postgres is made as more like a general purpose database. It takes a lock, that's true. And 
there are new databases and I'm always interested in learning more about those like distributed SQL database or the new SQL world like CockroachDB you mentioned or Yugabyte database and these are Postgres compatible. Are they doing the same thing or do they have different problems when it comes to the increase in volume? I think this is the problem. Even if you look at if, if you look at other in the cloud, there's is, is this Dynamo. In theory, you get unlimited scalability if you go horizontal. In practice, if you look at a, a transactional workload, and, and I mean it in the double entry sense where there is a counterparty and you have four bank accounts and you have a billion customers and you need to ingest a billion transactions every 30 minutes through only four rows. You, you really can't, you can't do much horizontally with four rows. And if you start to split that over 20 machines, it, it just gets worse. I think the way that, that we like to solve it is say a CPU is so fast. I love that Frank McSherry paper where it was scalability exclamation mark. And then the question says, yes, the paper asks the question, yes, but at what cost? And they show that actually we've been building these systems that you sure you scale them to a hundred machines and you can rewrite them on a single core and it's faster. And as soon as you get to very high contention workloads, it, you can just zoom in and in. It's the same reason there, there are times where you, for example, Red Panda, I love their design because they are thread per core. It doesn't mean that they are not multi-threaded. It means that they are very conscious about contention. So. They're happy to scale out within a machine and, and go multi-threaded, but they never expose contention across cores because as soon as you do that, everything grinds to a halt. So if you take that principle and say, yes, we believe in thread per core, wherever there's contention, it must be on a single core. It's fine to scale out horizontally, but you cannot do that if there's contention, because one of the two nodes must give up and, and they must move the data. So, and obviously moving data over a network is going to take much longer than a context switch between threads. So if we know not to do, not to have contention at the multi-threading layer, how much more must we be careful of that in distributed systems, especially where you have network, whether network latencies are not predictable across cloud availability zones. You've got to be very careful whenever. This was one of the things when we chatted to um, someone who was re that really built ledgers, they were really good at it. And we were asking people for advice. The one thing they said to us is just, if you're going to touch the network, wary, because anything that touches the network can fail. You've got latency, unpredictability. So, so that, that's still why I would say highly available databases that are horizontal are fantastic for general purpose workloads. They fit the workload because you have a big mix of read and write. You can scale those differently, read replicas. It makes sense. But I think if you, the other way to look at this is, well, what are they doing in the high frequency trading world? And everybody there is running single core. They have the Almax architecture, single core, they replicate it. They still use threads, but they're very careful about contention. So again, it's kind of the red panda philosophy. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's a great point. And I love the example that you gave on if you have so many, like hundreds of hundreds and thousands of transactions, but they want locks on four rows, that's going to be very challenging and interesting. So the next point we talk about is safety. And I can imagine why safety is so important when we are especially dealing with finance and money. And I want my money to be safe. So let's talk a little bit about why safety is so critical and why, again, the traditional databases do it differently, which might not be suitable for the present day workload and volume. Yeah, sure. This is a... Uh... Safety is, is the most important thing to us. It's, it's also the thing that got me really excited because in 2020, July, again, we were really lucky with timing. So a lot of Tiger Beetle is really, the spirit of Tiger Beetle is how can we pay tribute? How can we pay it forward? Because people have paid it forward to me and I, I would thank them and they would say to me, pay it forward. Uh, and really, I, w I wouldn't be here today with, without people like that. And 
So a lot of the spirit of Tiger Beetle is the same. How can we shine a spotlight on great research and how can we pay it forward? And so that the timing of Tiger Beetle and safety at July 2020, th there had been, I was just somehow I, I decided to pick my conference, pick my domain, not get distracted. Computer science was obvious, it had already blown up as a field, but I couldn't follow everything. I, I realized, okay, I'm going to make a choice. I'm not going to go into AI like in 2015. I'm, I'm going to go into storage and, and just do one, try to focus. But there, what I was seeing was there was so much research that on the one hand, I love Postgres. I love my SQL, SQLite. They're 20 to 30 years old. So Postgres, for example, I think is June 96, and it's a year after Windows 95 in perspective. And I grew up on Windows, I grew up on DOS, Windows 3.1, Windows. And so you can say, well, that's fantastic. And it is, it's a testament to Michael Stonebreak. And it's, it is something to be truly grateful for this tradition of open source, which is why Tiger Beetle is open source in Apache 2. And it's why we don't make people sign CLAs because th then it's not really open source, is it? So, so we're Apache 2. And th this is the thing is that Postgres and them are, are fantastic. They are tried and tested. They are, they represent decades or, or centuries of contributor time. There's about 40 people that contribute to, to Postgres and about, I think the core of that is about 16 people. That is actually, which I find interesting because people will say to us, how can we bet on such a young company? And I think, well, we're, we're basic, we're getting, we're on the order of Postgres team here too. It, 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 jokes aside, Postgres is tried and tested. So SQLite, obviously, my SQL, how can we possibly hope to be better than, as safe as something that is tried and tested? And I think this is what excited me is that there was research. Yes, they are tried and tested. It also means we know how they performed and researchers really have looked at this. So in 2020, they looked at F-Sync gate, which happened in 2018. That was where users, Craig Ringer reported that Postgres lost data and it shouldn't have. So there was a routine disk fault, a latent sector error, which Postgres accelerated into user data loss and it wasn't necessary. So MySQL Postgres, they all applied this fix where they panic. If they get an F-Sync error, they panic. Basically what was happening was the kernel was not able to write something from the page cache. It would mark the page clean in the page cache and the database would think that page was durable and it wasn't, so it was used data. So what they would start to do, and I think they still do it, is when they get that error, they would panic and then they would restart and read the log and recover. And that was in 2018. And then in 2020, you, you researchers at UW Medicine, they asked the question, can, it, did it work? Is that the fix? And what they found is that MySQL, all, all of them, when they panic, they come back up and they read the log, but they don't use direct IO. So they're actually still reading from the kernel page cache. So they still think the page is durable and it's not. There's another related story here. So Foundation DB, they, um, Alex Miller there reached out to me and told me one of the things that they learned. And this is the trick. When you open a file, the first thing you do is call fsync on it. And I don't know, it, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll give us a few seconds to puzzle out why. Why must you, when you open your database, when your database opens its file, why must you immediately call fsync? And the answer is that even if you're using direct IO, which most databases don't, or you have to enable that specifically, Postgres is still adding support for direct IO. I think it started to come in now as a developer preview, but even if you use direct IO, you still have to call fsync because you might just be reading, not from the kernel page cache, you might have gone a layer lower to the disk, but you're still reading from the disk cache. And that also might not be durable. So you have to first fsync data, so you know it's durable, so you're recovering from a log, you're making decisions as a database on what is durable. So anyway, safety, how do, how, you know, why do we need safety or how do we get it? These were, kinds of, these were the kinds of things that we had seen and, and there's much more to this, but I got excited because I realized, well, these are, to fix these things properly, you require foundational design changes. You have, 
you, you can't just remodel the house a little bit. You actually, the foundation needs to be relayed. And so, for example, Postgres, you have to introduce asynchronous IO. You can't, it's not as simple as just setting the odirect flag. You need a user space page cache, everything changes. So, and I realized, well, we actually had the opportunity to just run with it and, and take all these great papers and just follow the recommendations. And so this, and the kind of the other angle on it is that even if we had said to people, okay, great, here's Tiger Beetle. We're as safe as OLGP databases, MySQL, SQLite, Postgres. It's still not good enough. They're still going to get nervous. They'll say, well, it's nice that you think you're as safe, but that's not good enough. So we kind of, I mean, by necessity, we had to be much, much safer. We had to be 10 times safer. And we kind of turn it around and say to people, well, we wanted to make people nervous that, that they're not, that they're not using they're, they're not following the recommendations of research, that they're not, that there actually are cases where they can lose data if their disk fails and disks do fail. Um, but it's just, a, it's a black swan event. It's waiting to happen. So yeah, that was kind of the, 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 the thing is like, let's actually just, it's not, it's not enough to be as good as 30 years ago. We need to take all these learnings that we've had as an industry and what could we do if we now want to do OLTP for the next 30 years? How is that going to look? And I was so excited that we just had the opportunity just to go and do it, what we thought it would look like. So this is our painting of, of what we think it should be. That's amazing. And you are such an amazing storyteller. I mean, there are so many little stories that you tied together and explain why safety is important and what happened and how did you think about it and what's the vision? So. Yeah, I, it's really insightful. I am so excited to directly dive deep into how things are working when it comes to performance and safety measures and Tiger Beetle DB. And of course, there is sort of how users now use Tiger Beetle DB and is that changing? Because when I use Postgres, I know how I am dealing with it, right? So is the user interface or the developer experience also changing with Tiger Beetle DB as compared to the traditional databases? Yes. So it does change. And the, so it's, what we were doing when Tiger Beetle came about is it, it, way to think of Tiger Beetle is like Ruby on Rails. Someone built Basecamp and then they said, ah, oh, here's a framework. Let's extract it from something real, a real problem. So we were looking at a real payment switch and they had built a OLTP database and they had built it around a general purpose database, MySQL in their case, and they had built it with 10,000 lines of code to enable them to track business transactions. And, and what we saw, the, the first problem was that for every logical business transaction, a double entry transaction between two people, there were 10 to 20 physical SQL queries. And this was just to do double entry. So we realized this is a problem. The world is, has become a thousand times more transactional. And for each one of those, we have to do, there's an impedance mismatch. We have to do 10 SQL queries. And this is roughly, this is a very good rule of thumb. Whenever you chat to people who've built ledgers, you should, typically this is what you see. So this is, some people can do it. They, there are people that do it one for one, for sure. That was the person who told us they're very worried about network weather. Don't, whatever you don't hit the network. So there are people that do one logical business transaction, one SQL, for sure you can do it. And you can even do better. You can start to look at stored procedures. But so does the developer experience change? And what we saw just from first principles was that it had to change because for many years, 30 years, OLTP was here. The world has pulled the elastic out and you start to see that now there's not only the contention in the workload, it's also the data direction. In the past, it didn't matter. We, we could cope with it. The scale has increased so much that now you have to start to ask the question, how do you optimize a, data, a database for ingest? And SQL is the best language if your data direction is out, if, if you're querying, or if you're doing a 50-50 read-write split, if you're general purpose. Because typically these general purpose databases are in the control plane. They're not S3. They're not streaming platforms. They're not Red Panda. So they're, the, the control plane databases are out of the data plane. 
They have to do with business entities, your users, passwords, names, all the variable length data, all of that that changes. Blog post comments or the metadata for transactions or your inventory of shoes and colors and all of that. But that's typically a different type of data. It, it, it isn't exposed to the same scale that, that real-time transactions are, are exposing. And so because of the volume and the data direction becomes so much more important. And then the question is, well, is SQL the best data format language? And it isn't, in my view. And that is because if we take a step back and we've spoken about Moore's law, you don't want to bet against Moore's law because even if it's, if it's decelerating, it's still better than a constant, which, which is never going to change. Speed of light and fiber is a constant. So, but if you, that's CPU, but if you look at like network and the, we call a tiger beetle, we call this the four primary colors of systems design, there's network. There's disk, there's memory, there's CPU. The textures of these paints or colors are latency and bandwidth. You have them for all four of them. And if you look at bandwidth of network is increasing, uh, disk is increasing, memory is increasing. You can take a disk and you can strike uh, with RAID 0 and you can increase your bandwidth. But if you take a single CPU core, and remember again, like context switches and, and contention is a problem. So you can't take a single CPU core and just strike memory bandwidth. And so what actually is happening today is that bandwidth is increasing, but network and disk are overtaking memory bandwidth. So your scarcest resource is memory bandwidth. It's the way that you talk to the CPU and it is becoming like a, a little bow tie. It's pinching everything. And if it, this was sort of my background, how do you write fast algorithms? And it's always, it's not the CPU, it's the memory. Look at that because that sort of, everything has to squeeze through memory bandwidth, which is limited as our networks have more and more bandwidth disks, NVMe, it's like three gigs a second and even much more, but per core bandwidth, you, you can't stripe. So, and, and then again, if you now have a data format language, which is variable length and which involves memory copies, now as you're getting data in, you're burning memory bandwidth. And for a database, papers have looked at this, but I think there was one about Alice in Wonderland, which is one of my favorites. But that, that is the reason why actually for OLTP you want, because the data is so boring, accounting is very boring. It's two parties. It's the who, what, when, where, why, how much. There's very little data. It's about 64 to 128 bytes. And you can represent any business transaction in any industry in the world. It, every business can be modeled in terms of that schema. It's a centuries old schema. It's very simple and highly composable, flexible. But you don't need the cost of variable length data definition language and you don't want to burn. So if you want to scale, it, it's best not to be halving or your memory bandwidth from the outset. So the, these were all things and we realized, well, OLTP is very boring, but it's a lot of it coming in. What would be the perfect definition language? What would be speed of light? And we realized, well, we have to get serialization is a big cost. If you look at a JSON, it's a huge cost in systems. It can be 10% or more. And so we said, well, we must get rid of it. It's got to go. And it, 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 you, you're like Captain Proto. You're always going to be faster if you don't serialize. So you'll be faster than Protobuf. So we wanted to get rid of it. And we said, well, accounting is, it's not going to change. It hasn't changed. We, we hope for a few hundred years, it hasn't changed. Let's bet on double entry as a schema. Let's just use, we do the old trick they used to do in NTP where you say, okay, we're going to be little Indian. Almost all systems these days are little Indian. And we point as fixed size struct coming off the wire and we're done. So that's what we do in Tiger Beetle. So the developer experience changes, but in a way it also gets better because now you're not trying to concatenate strings of SQL in your application. You just have a Go client. Uh, you can ORM, uh, apologies, but in a way it, 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 it can be much easier if you can just express here is an object, which is my transaction. And that just goes onto the wire and comes out. Very interesting. Yeah. So does it mean that the impedance mismatch problem is also gone? 
or that solves that. So that means now that where in the past you would have had between one to 20 physical SQL queries on average, it's 10. So again, just to be careful, we're not saying that you can't do it one for one. You can, but very few people are able to build ledgers like that. Most, even the very good systems, they average 10 because there's just more business logic. So, so yes, this solves that. So now you're looking at one business transaction is one 28 bytes and it's cache line aligned, very friendly for memory. It's zero copy. Everything is word aligned and it's just, it's optimal. So it's 128 bytes and that's it for one business transaction in a single database round trip across the network where before with these systems, you would have had a little bit of a water, waterfall. So you wouldn't just send 10 queries. You would have had to, you would have had some barriers and you would have sent a query to look up the balance and then another one, because usually there's fraud checks. It's not, you can't just do a incrementing. It's a little bit more business logic for these things. So, so basically you get rid of multiple round trips that are in series. Some are parallel, but you will have about two to three barriers and you can get rid of all that and replace that with one. But we didn't stop there. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Let's go <clears throat> right into the, the architecture and how things are working exactly, <laughs> right? So Tiger Beetle DB, let's start from the high level. <clears throat> what is the architecture like? Okay, so at the high level, it's what is called a replicated state machine. So I don't actually think of myself as a database person. I'm, <clears throat> I think of myself more as I, I love data structures and I think of myself actually as a file systems person. And a lot of file systems, the first thing is there's a log. So what happens is something is about to happen. You append it to a log and then you go and apply the effects. That means that if you crash, you come back up and you're consistent on disk. So a replicated state machine is exactly that. You have a pure function takes an input and it applies that input to some global state and produces an output. And what you do is you put a log in front of that and something is about to happen, put it in the log, put it through the state machine, and that's your, that's a database, or that can be some other software system, that could be a file system. So that's a more classical way to see these things is a state machine. And then what is a replicated state machine? Well, you've got a log and you've got a pure function and you've got state. And again, I mean, if you look at Redis, if, if people are familiar with Redis, they'll know Redis has got the append only file stuff gets appended. It gets processed through me Redis's in memory data structures. That's the state machine. And then from time to time, Redis will dump that in memory state to disk so that it can truncate the log for quicker startup time. So that is a state machine. And then replicated state machine is saying, well, we've got a log. Let's use a consensus algorithm so that we have the same log. We can agree to have the same log across multiple machines. Now we've got replication. I think people actually misunderstand consensus. 90% of consensus is actually replication. It isn't costly. Whenever someone talks about the cost of consensus, I think, yeah, I want to say to them, really consensus is like, usually there's four to five sub protocols. Only one of them is typically consensus. The rest of them, and the main one is what, what in view stamp replication is called the normal protocol. It's just pure replication. It's what you're doing if you use Postgres. You write to Postgres, you replicate somewhere else, and then you act. There's no difference. Consensus is what happens 1% of the time where your primary fails and you want to elect another. That is the cost of consensus. But in the normal path, there is no cost. It is replication. The question is more, can you afford to lose data? That is a cost that you risk user data. And obviously you, you can't risk user data, so you need replication. So a replicated state machine, that is it. And that, I think Paxos has fooled people or people have been fooled by the, the charm of Paxos because Paxos really is, it's the one of the sub protocols. It's, but a more useful form is actually view stamp replication or raft. Raft is really view stamp replication with the concepts renamed and with a few 
restrictions or concessions to make maybe to, to it's to make it a, a learning experiment. But view stamp replication is really it's the same thing, but it's what you want to implement if you're engineering this because it's it gives you the, it's slightly better properties than Raft. Uh, Raft is great as an educational resource to get people excited about consensus, which was the aim of the paper. Uh, but view stamp replication is actually the original protocol. Raft refers to this. It's most similar to view stamp. It's actually identical, just with the concessions. But so we use view stamp replication to give us agreement on the same log across machines, and then we process that through the state machine. So that that is the architecture of Tiger Beetle. Awesome. That sounds very simple. I'm sure it's not when we <laughs> implement it. So log is my favorite data structure. Like it's just everywhere. Like you talk about any database, any system, log is always there. And it's many of the, many of times it's just the backbone of how systems are working, right? Yeah. And you mentioned a state, right? Like, so replicated state machine, I understand it's a replicated log that is keeping some state. What state is mm. it? Like when it comes to, let's say, the financial transaction that is happening, what does a state mean? Yes, it's so simple, KV. It's, by the way, I, like, I love the log too. When I looked at Redis and the append only file, it opened my eyes and I realized, wow, there's so much you can build with this. And it's the same reason why I like the array, just a piece of memory as an array. And I love Zig, what you can do with arrays and slices. But I just love that. It's my favorite. If I'm trying to implement something, I think, well, how can I solve it with an array, even with a linear scan? And I love how Antares did that in Redis. But what do we store in state? And again, Redis opened my eyes that you can have a bag of data structures. In our case, it was like, well, we've got lots of these little 128-byte business transactions or double entry. We call them transfers. And then you have accounts. So you have transfers between accounts. So two types in Tiger Beetle, it's that simple. They're both 128 bytes, fixed size structs. And that is enough to represent every kind of business using financial accounting. You just always add accounts. It's the most composable, most flexible because you, these are so simple. You just, for any problem, you can add more accounts and you can model more interesting financial state transitions. But so anyway, coming back to it, the state machine has now got two object types, accounts and transfers. The other aspect of Tiger Beetle's architecture where we go a bit further than Redis, Redis has a problem if you have very big in-memory state, you have to dump that to disk. Gigabytes can take minutes to write. Well, not if you're a few hundred. And again, with OLTP, the volume is just going off the charts. So you need you can't have these pauses while you fork and, and try to write a disk. So that means that what we've got in Tiger Beetle, we've got the log, we've got the consensus, we're replicated. Obviously, you can't use a single node MySQL or Postgres anymore for online transactions because what happens if your node goes down? There's no consensus. You can lose data in the fall in the failover. So for mission critical financial data, you can't have one copy. You need a replicated state machine. You also can't have latency spikes as you're trying to dump the state to disk. So you, what we have is we have the LSM data structure, which is like a pyramid. If your data fits in memory, it's only in memory, like Redis. But as your data gets bigger, it starts to naturally go to disk in a way that is right optimal. And you, it's a very nice structure because you can also tune it in terms of reads or writes or space efficiency in terms of the run conjecture. Interesting. I was looking at, I, I don't remember exactly, but it was something from Microsoft Research. And they were talking about the spikes that you mentioned, right? Like when you have these spikes, when you have, want to flush the levels of LSM tree to disk and sort of merge them. So this sort of compaction process takes up a lot of resources and it also spikes the IO. How, how are you handling it? Yes. Yeah, that's great. So we, we've spoken about availability and durability, and now we're getting to like predictability. And this is so important and, and it comes straight to your point. So when, when I chat to like researchers at fourth labs in, in Crete and, and there are these papers, there's actually two classes, Jeff Dean and Microsoft had like papers on gray failure, just that disc. So you can have a disc and you try to write to the disc and it takes four seconds. And then it gets better. So even 
this is we've the whole architecture of Tiger Beetle. What we've done differently is the consensus is not off the shelf raft. It's not isolated components. We've co-designed everything. So the consensus and the storage engine, the LSM, are actually integrated. What that means is that if the disk is slow, we have things, and we, we can we, we we're still going to invest a lot into this, a lot more techniques, but. For example, if we're writing to the log, the storage in the consensus is writing to the log, and that is slow, the primary isn't blocked by that if its disk is slow. It only needs a quorum of X from the rest of the cluster, and, and the primary can already start working even if its disk is slow. So we can tolerate gray failure because that is kind of the next frontier um, is in transactions processing, you need very hard bounds on latency. Again, one user transaction could be a thousand business transactions. If one of them takes one millisecond, your one second SLA is blown. If they all take one, one millisecond, that's you've basically, you're going to blow your SLA. So you, you've got to be so tight on all of them. But then again, you, like you've touched on, the other area is, is they call it, um, com it's compaction latency spikes in LSM trees. So RocksDB and there's the paper Silk that looks at this and others, is that these are open systems. So the compaction is typically asynchronous. It's a background job, and you'll spin up like eight background threads. And it sounds like a good idea until you realize that your eight background threads are using up all your disk bandwidth, and now a foreground client request comes in, and it is starved for disk bandwidth. So Actually, what we've done in Tiger Beetle is our whole LSM is designed that we do. It's like, if you remember V8 in JavaScript, it used to be stop the world GC. And a lot of like rocks, they've done a lot of work on optimizing this, but there are times when it will stop the world if the compaction is not keeping up with the ingest. And again, OLTP, it's all, this is the fire hose and it's not going to stop. So we're very careful in Tiger Beetle that as data comes in, we do just enough work so that we know we can accept the next piece of data and we do no more work, but it's carefully everything. It's caref there's congestion control that we can guarantee that there are no stop the world pauses. So we've taken compaction and made it paced and incremental, just like they did in V8, so that you don't feel that in your main event loop if you were writing JavaScript, but this is the database equivalent. And how we do that is also fundamental because in Tiger Beetle, there's no dynamic allocation of memory <clears throat> after startup. So we actually follow the NASA power of 10 rules for safety critical code. The big piece of that is that you cannot allocate memory dynamically. And I mean this, so this is static memory allocation as a principle. I don't mean it as you would implement it in the C compiler where it's all in the stack. I mean, just the principle static limits on memory allocation. So in Tiger Beetle, every piece of memory that we use, we know if we execute any permutation of the consensus protocol or storage engine, we've worked it all out. We know exactly <clears throat> how much memory would be used. So this is very different to a user, like a slab. People often say, isn't this just a rena allocation? And I say, no, this is understanding the physics of the database. As water is flowing into the bathtub, in your LSM, and that bathtub overflows into a bigger bathtub, into a bigger bathtub, we want to make sure that the, in, the water coming in and the water leaving it, that the rate must be the same. So that's just what we do for, for LSM compaction to solve those write stalls. Um, but we do it everywhere in the consensus. I, everything is limited and we know the limits, but that enables us to solve these problems. So if you don't, if you're writing in a language so this isn't in C, often you do, it's manual memory management. This is beyond that. So I think typically as programmers, we're used to dynamic languages. So we're not thinking in terms of limits. We're not even thinking in terms of memory. This is sort of trying to go back in time. Let's be old school again. Let's put hard physical limits so that we can produce a database that is like a solid block. You, as an operator, you know what this thing is going to do because it's not just going to be like a jumping castle and fall over. It's if, if you send it a lot of load, it will process the load and shed the rest of the load. It's got very good limits like that. So.
Uh, Very interesting. I could, we, I, I could talk for hours on it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and you're welcome for doing many more episodes. So that, that's totally fine. <laughs> so you mentioned about the predictability, right? So it's basically on prioritization. So you prioritize the real-time traffic that is coming up as compared to compaction. It sounds great. And you, so you kind of find these gaps between the real-time traffic and try to do compaction and get it up to speed. But if I understand correctly, it's, it's another trade-off, right? Like you, so let's say there is the real-time traffic coming up. Uh, there are so many transactions and that your compaction is not able to keep up. Is it possible that this might in turn impact the reads because you might end up reading more the, the LSM files, for example? That's fine because we, again, we have a hard guarantee on the tree shape. So we never let the, the shape of the tree is what affects read amplification. I th someone gave very good advice for how, how do you design LSM? And the advice they said was, you can optimize the LSM for reads, you can optimize it for space amplification, or you can optimize it for writes. Generally, there's, it's easier to solve read amplification. You can give cache, but write amplification is always very hard to solve. So focus on that. And so in Tiger Beetle, we've really tried to solve write amplification, compaction. How do we make that perfect? And so we, if we can't keep up, the user will see that as back pressure. So if they are overwhelming, so Tiger Beetle, we're designing for a million transactions a second with primary indexes and change data capture indexes. If you try out Tiger Beetle today, that will have 20 secondary indexes also enabled. And for that, we're aiming for 500,000 transactions per second. And these are business transactions. And you, at present, I think we're on about 250,000 a second. We should get it up to 500K with, and that is with indexes on all your data. But so if someone, if they want primary indexes and they, if they need to do more than a million a second, then they're going to see that compaction is not keeping up, but that will be back pressure. Um, so, we, which is a good thing, which is what you want, yeah. but we, what they're not, they're going to see it predictably. So they're not going to see lumpy one because typically in the silk paper, there were one to two second stalls, very common. And then chatting with fourth labs in Crete, they were saying, well, actually it's worse. It's like 10 seconds. But the way to solve that is to know the future. So if you know that the next request has a hard limit in terms of all the different types of work you can do, you can be ready for that. You've done just in time compaction, just enough. And so you, so Tiger Beetle's always doing that, but it works like, like gears in a clock. As a request comes in, we do compaction and so. But this is where we take predictability, we, like determinism, we go very far. And this was advice from Wisconsin Madison. Again, if we go back to the replicated state machine architecture, you've got multiple machines, you've got a cluster, you've got replication, you've got a log log, you've got state. Typically what you see if you spin up a distributed database today is if you look at all those data files, if you shut down the cluster at midnight and you look at all the data files, they're all different. They, they're going to have a lot of it's the same logical data, but the physical data file is all different because the compaction rocks, it's RocksDB and RocksDB is not co-designed with the global cluster. So it's not integrated with the global redundancy that you have. Tiger Beetle, the storage, the LSM, the storage engine of each replica is deterministic. So given the same log, it will compact in exactly the same way, byte for byte on disk. And that was a tip from Martin Thompson of LMAX. How do you run these mission critical systems that must process? It's being run by a central bank for a country. How do you build systems like that? What you want is very strong guarantees, but also you want to be able to verify your data. So you shut down your data at night when the markets close, you go and look at your data files. Are they byte for byte the same? If, so what we've really done with Tiger Beetle is not a distributed database. We've designed a deterministic distributed database, which gives you very strong guarantee as an operator, because you can actually go and do that and look at your data file. If you look at, obviously the data file is sparse. So if you look at the holes, they can be different, but where the actual data is being referenced in the copy on write uh, tree on disk, that tree is exactly the same. And that is a hard guarantee. So if we test for that and check that, if that ever goes off, we shut down the system safely immediately. That's kind of taking predictability to a whole new level, but it's very nice because it just, 
when we work on Tiger Beetle as engineers, we operate in, the, in a different world. You've got physical limits now. It's kind of what you always want for software. The, I think the thing that makes software so, so hard compared to physical engineering is that in the physical world, you have limits, but in software, it's inception. We're building things in the sky, but they can fall over because we don't know our systems. They're, they're, you can't reason about them. So as soon as you're forced to do static memory allocation, the second order effect is you're forced to think through the physics of the database, how data flows, which you have to think about if you've got this fire hose coming in. So yeah, it's just, and, and then when you apply determinism on top of that, it sounds hard, but really what you're doing is you just forced, instead of having production incidents, you now have design incidents because now you f you discover these things in the design phase even before you're coding. So, yeah, and that is yeah, but by the way, uh, sorry, Kevy, just to add, this is the, our like our methodology for building Tiger Beetle. The way we do it is called Tiger Style. So we've got a, a doc on our in our repo called Tiger Style, and we just share all of these techniques. If if people want to go in, and you, you can apply this to any startup and just apply Tiger Style. Yeah, awesome. That is that's such an interesting uh, way to think about it, right? And predictability is something that we all want from our software. And that's many times missing because of several different reasons. Great. Mm. So I think right path is I, I know how I got my data in there. It's safe. It's mm. performant. I can do million or uh, many transactions per second without contention. There's predictable performance. Now, how do I read my data? So I have the log, I have the state, right, in the logs. Now, when I say read, it's not just about, okay, give me this transaction, but it could be like, give me all my transactions or something like that. How does that work? Yes. So I, I realize I've missed something important on the right path. And that is actually that we don't do one business transaction in one physical database transaction. We want it to go further than that. So if you were really good and you can do one business transaction is one SQL transaction, what we wanted to do in Tiger Beetle is say, well, then we're just doing one for one, but how do we scale with a world that has become a thousand times more transactional, like literally in, in so many sectors? And sure, like you can't go horizontal because the workload is contentious. So what do you do? The, the only... You have to change. Instead of thinking about scalability, we have to start to think about before we scale out, let's look at our unit of scale. Let's make that a thousand times faster. Because you can actually do that because CPUs are so fast. So that's what we focused on with Tiger Beetle. So we, we're not really interested in scalability. We're interested, well, we, of course we are. But I think the more interesting question is scalability at what cost? So cost efficiency is the key because anything can scale. But if you take something that is not memory efficient, it's doing memory copies, and then you scale that, you're going to be expensive. So what you want is a cost efficient unit of scale. That way you can scale cost efficiently. So the key thing what we do is when you do one query to Tiger Beetle, one network round trip, one database request, the whole thing, the consensus protocol, the, the API to Tiger Beetle, the clients that we've designed that are in your language so that there's no string concatenation, which is again, performance killer. The storage engine, everything is designed. We realize that in everything is a batch. So if in SQL, normally, if you want to do one thing, you send one query, but actually like everything is a batch. It's just a question of if it's a batch of one or 10,000. So in one database query to Tiger Beetle, you can, because the transactions are small, we actually pack on the order of 10,000 business transactions. So that means that if you're really good, you can build a ledger around SQL. You can do one business transaction in one SQL query. With Tiger Beetle, naturally out of the box, you're doing 10,000 transactions in one query. This is very hard to compete with. You'd have to be doing stored procedures. But even then, so, so this is really the key to Tiger Beetle's performance on the right path is the batching that, that and that actually gives you also the best latency. It follows like a U, U curve because you get more throughput, so there's less queuing. So you, yeah. as your system gets busier, you're processing more. Um, yeah. 
So read path. Uh, <laughs> no, that's a, that's um, a great point. Thanks for adding it. Mm. So yeah, let's look at the read path. Okay, so the read path is really boring. Here, we wouldn't get a job at DuckDB Labs. We went to go and visit them and we asked them. The stuff that they do is so amazing. Also for Umbra, but so really it's so boring because for OLTP, the, the questions are very simple in the data plane. Because in the data plane, you're not really looking at the universe of data, like coming back to what you said. In analytics, you're looking, you're asking very interesting questions. Why? What if? In OLTP, it's more like, does the user have enough money in their account? And that you can even solve in the right path. Tiger Beetle can do those checks without a round trip. So the read path is more like, for this account, get me the transaction history. So it's very much like Kafka or like change data capture. It's like a log. And you're just streaming the log out to someone either in reverse chronological order, maybe we're building our query at the, at the moment, you can query accounts and get your transaction history or look up individual accounts, get their balances, look up transfers. It's that simple. And that's really like what you need for showing the user their orders, just list the orders and, and drill into that, list their balance. So there, there's very little on the read side. It's all the last three years, all our focus and the big problem is on the, just how do you get the data in? Once you've got it into Tiger Beetle, you can, we're, we're planning that you'll be able to CDC it out in, in where all the magic happens in OLAP land. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. One thing I'm missing here is, so you have the log and is the log kind of indexed in, in some key value store so you can look up things or is there a key value store in there or how, how does that work? Sure. So. There's a distinction to be made. Uh, there is a log for consensus. That is the physical consensus log. Yeah. There is also in, for example, in your interview with Twisp, that was fantastic. And they gave a perfect de definition of a ledger database. So it's immutable history. It's a log. And obviously you can check maybe people haven't tampered it. But the big thing is it's a log of events. So that is now, if we're in accounting, that is another log. So you've got physical consensus log, yeah. logical business transactions log so that you can get out of Tiger Beetle. You can query that and go and see that. But we store all of this information in the LSM. And here what's interesting is actually the LSM is not an LSM tree, it's an LSM forest. So we store every index is a whole separate LSM tree. Every object is a separate. So there's actually 20 to 30 LSM trees in Tiger Beetle so that we can get rid of length prefixes. And RocksDB, it's gonna store a length prefix for data. If you're only storing like a 64-bit value, you don't want a length prefix because that's like 30% of your write bandwidth gone. So that's why we do this in Tiger Beetle. But, and again, it's the accounting workload is immutable. So you, what you have is transactions coming in and you never change them again and they come in sorted chronological order. So we have a tree in Tiger Beetle for just for those transfers. And that tree then we've got optimization. Well, any tree in Tiger Beetle, if the workload is immutable and chronological, it doesn't do compaction. So the performance of the LSM tree actually approaches the performance of a append-only log, so like perfect append-only performance to disk. So, and half of Tiger Beetle's data are the transfers. So, so that is how we really like focus on solving write amplification. It, it, normally, if you take a distributed database, it's got one RocksDB, it puts all different types of data in there. So straight away, you've halved performance and it gets worse because now you're, you only typically have 100,000 accounts. It's very small, but those are going to churn all the time as you update balances and they're going to churn through all your big transactional data, which you don't want or need. So separating the data out like that it's also great for reads because reads come in. They don't have to look through the whole 100 terabyte. In some cases, that's how much data these people process, 100 terabytes. If you're only interested in 100,000 accounts, just go to the accounts tree and that's much better read performance. So you actually, you can do better than the RUM conjecture if you start to zoom out and think of it in terms of different trees that automatically optimize for different workloads. You, you keep saying boring, but it's so interesting. Keep, you also keep sharing those interesting facts. So yeah, definitely yeah. very interesting. I mean, as you said, you, 
I can ask you questions for hours and we can go on and on, but you know, there's, hmm. of course, the time is limited. So let's yep. talk a little bit about some of the use cases that you've seen or people could use Tiger D Beetle D before, like uh, apart from finance. Sure. Yeah. So this is the other thing is that you get financial accounting, which is like a type system. You've got really five types, assets, expenses, increase on the debit side. You've got liabilities, income and equity accounts. They increase on the credit side and that's it. That's the type system of accounting. And obviously the, the, you can model businesses like that, but take away financial and you end up with just accounting. And really that's just a way to count very well, but count in a way that you're seeing how things move. So you're not just recording balances, but you're actually seeing how you arrived at those balances. So how, so why, if, if you're a startup and you're offering a serverless product or some API, that's your product. You're a startup with an API. You want to track usage and count usage. You can use accounting for that. If you're an energy company, you want to track kilowatt hours and how that moves. Kilowatt hours move through the grid to different, you can use accounting as well. So that, that energy example, they would use Tiger Beetle for the billing, but they would actually use it even just to track the raw kilowatt hours. And if you're a game developer, you would use counting for your, for your, you, you would use financial accounting for your in-game economy, and then you'd use counting for your vital stats. So th those would, I'm kind of looking, I think people are going to come up with the most, more interesting examples. So we are always learning from people using Tiger Beetle. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. I think there's one other use case is that we've designed the whole architecture that you can take the accounting state machine out and you can put your own business logic in and create a Redis database that's distributed. Any kind of database that is more, you, you really want to solve what LSM is good for, that, that is, and that's open source. So we're still getting there in terms of packaging that up nicely for people, but Actually, T Tiger Beetle is like a deterministic distributed database framework. And our, like Ruby on Rails, again, we, we doing, we came out of a real problem. Let's, it is a real problem we're excited about, but also making a technical contribution. Uh, awesome. To end this amazing session, I have to ask you this. What is Tiger Beetle DB not made for? What are the use cases that are not create if you use Tiger Beetle DB. Yeah, so we're not a DuckDB, we're huge fans of them. We're not a panda, red panda, huge fans of them. We're not an elephant, cockroach, Postgres, MySQL, SQLite, like huge fans of OLGP, general purpose. So we're not a control plane database in that sense for general purpose data. Uh, Tiger Beetle is for OLTP and where we see OLTP over the next 30 years, massive increase in transactions volume. Even AI agents are going to be blowing that out of the water as well. And we're not even there yet. So, so just like, how do you get data in? That is Tiger Beetle. But we're not, not to say that we won't have SQL connectors. We, we almost certainly will, that you can query your ledger with SQL. Sure. The, but CDC solves that for many people. Get it into your warehouse. Yeah, that's what it's not. I think the other thing it's not is we haven't, we don't test Tiger Beetle in a way that needs decades of testing. So it's not the way you would build a database 30 years ago. We've, it's a different database. So we, we haven't touched on this, but the deterministic simulation testing we do, we can actually speed up time and we can simulate the, because it's a deterministic database, we can run it in a special like flight simulator and we can speed up the clock and actually get to test centuries in a day. We run a, a hundred cores simulating Tiger Beetle and we speed up time so that by a factor of, I think, 700 X. So in one second, we've tested Tiger Beetle for 700 seconds. And that, that is, Tiger Beetle is not the way you would have built a database a few years ago. It's something different. Awesome. Well, uh, Yaron, I can't thank you enough for sharing all those amazing stories and insights and internals of Tiger Beetle DB. Uh, I'm pretty sure we, our viewers are going to find all those stories really insightful and they will become more curious to figure out more like how things are working. And for our viewers, if you like what we discussed today, do check it out. It's an amazing database. If you are into accounting, if you are into finance, if you want something safe and performant, Tiger Be Beetle DB could be a great database for you. So, and if you like this episode, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel. And yeah, thanks a lot, Yaron, for joining me today. Thanks to you, KV. It's such, such a pleasure.